Okay, um, so welcome everyone again and thank you for joining us for our webinar series, which is hosted by Wild Welfare and Global Animal Welfare, two UK based charities and working with captive wild animals around the globe. Uh, so for this webinar, uh, we'd like to I'd like to introduce you to Dr. James Fisher, um, who's going to be talking about the importance of light in animal welfare. And this is very much an unrepresented field, um, which, which is often um, not even considered when we're talking about wild animal, domestic animal welfare, or even our welfare for that matter. Um, um, James's CV and, and, and bio is, is, is extremely impressive. So I'd urge you to go on to the Zoo Lighting Institute website to explore more about um, James's work. Um, so this is a very brief introduction um, and I'm probably not going to do it justice, but um, so uh, Dr. Fisher um, operates and, and, and launched the, the Zoo Lighting Institute, which is a US registered charity to support the science of light and life through art um, and animal welfare and wildlife conservation. Um, Dr. Fisher is a former member of the Royal Institute of British Architects and advocates the integration of biodiversity loss mitigation strategies in architecture by calling for the attention of the importance of natural light cycles and all living things. Uh, as a practicing architect, he contributed to the redesign of New York City after 9-11 in helping draft the New York, uh, New York New Vision white papers and served on international, um, as international committee chair for the New York chapter of the American Institute of Architects um, this led to the election to the Royal Institute of British Architect Council, from which he served a maximum of two, um, two consecutive terms. Um, in this capacity, Dr. Fish served as a liaison to architects around the globe, presenting uh, sorry, uh, presented at several British consulates uh, in the US, Japan and Singapore, and gave lectures on the importance of wildlife conservation as an architecture concern throughout Asia, Australia, Europe and the Americas. Um, so he founded the Zoo Lighting Institute in 2012 uh, and, and Dr. Fisher organised the work of this charity into four departments, including photoscience, animal welfare monitoring, which is the Zala aspect of it, which, which I'm sure he will talk about more, um, AWOSH, which is the animal welfare oriented design um, in architecture, and the photodiversity photo films. Um, and, and this was um, the photo diversity films um, as produced award winning films um, like The Brilliant Darkness, um, Hotora in the Night, um, and is also um, uh, pursuing additional film productions in conjunction with the Zoo Lighting Institute campaigns and is currently producing two anime series entitled The Afterlife of Wales and The Green Year. Uh, retrospectively considering cetacean and, and bird welfare, uh, a multicultural perspective. Um, I think I've talked enough. I will let James um, take over now. So if you're ready to, to either share your screen or, or start your presentation, James, I will just turn my camera off. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you. Uh, and here we go. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's always a treat to be able to present uh, work on light and wildlife. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful, actually, at the beginning to Wild Welfare, to Simon, David, Nick, Georgina, you know, for inviting us to come. Um, with animal welfare, different organizations, you know, we're all struggling to really work on uh, passionate you know, issues that we're passionate about that we feel very passionate for um, and but it's a competitive space and so i'm very very grateful to wild welfare and really look forward to working together going forward now with the zoological lighting institute uh, we do have that very uh clear but articulated um, mission you know to support the sciences of light and life through the arts for animal welfare and wildlife conservation um it's very uh, 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 targeted, you know, in what we're doing. We always come back to the science as a way to say, you know, 
figure out to figure out what's going on. Uh, and you know, we work through the arts because it's a multicultural space. You know, that allows for differences in opinion on what we want to do and and you know what we feel we need to do. And then finally, animal welfare and wildlife conservation. We see those as going together. Animal welfare really to focus on the individual biology of the animals, to focus on individual animals and humans' compassion. Uh, compassion for animals as a way to really increase the knowledge. And we feel that that benefits wildlife conservation because the decisions can be based in uh, uh, um, very thought out propositions. Now, we are humanitarians. Uh, we emphasize sustainable design goals in everything we do, looking at the value of this work for human communities. Now, I say all of this um, because uh, we really are keen to work in partnership uh, with other organizations. We've been an AZA uh, conservation partner for about a decade now, I think, uh, a JASA supporter for most of that time as well, and we just joined WAZA. Uh, we understand that um, uh, zoos and aquariums are absolutely integral to humans' relationships with wildlife. There's no getting around that. And it works in terms of entertainment, in terms of the science, in terms of um, community building. Uh, it's a very key, important part of who we are. Now, if there's one takeaway message about light and wildlife that I want to stress today, uh, it's that measuring light, understanding light, and understanding how animals relate to light is far more important than the lighting we buy, right? The lighting that we buy for our exhibits, our husbandry, uh, even for development, it's subservient to understanding what it is that we're doing. Uh, it's important, you know, as a supplemental uh, 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 strategy, you know, in care. And it's important in terms of simply uh, recognizing that, you know, lighting is just simply a fact of modern life in the 21st century. But measuring light, if we're talking about animal welfare, measuring light is the most important thing. And measuring those relationships that are specific to different individuals, species and habitats. That's really the, if there's one message to take away from today, it's that. Now, um, as another practical outcome of the talk this morning, uh, we are creating Zala animal welfare stations. And here, the idea is to take that measurement of animal welfare parameters uh, and, and a light centric one, which I'll get into in, 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 in the meat of the talk, uh, and actually place it on the ground uh, in all any anywhere we have animals and uh, humans interacting with each other uh, in in a very targeted way. And zoos and aquariums are a huge part of that. So the idea of having these independent stations is a way to build public trust, uh, but it's also a way to um, put animal welfare on a par with other uh, economically viable activities, right? Uh, moving into that space. So I put that right at the beginning here because I, I want to be really clear where we're going with all of this because I know sometimes webinars, you know, there's a time limit to these things. But our goals today are pretty simple. Uh, we want to talk about light in its biologically relevant uh, aspects. Uh, we want to talk about light in terms of why it's important to animal welfare and how it's important. Right? And when we talk about light, we're talking about the natural cycles of light. And then modifications come in relation to that. Uh, we'll outline what Azala animal welfare monitoring is in this uh, capacity, and then look to um, sustainable design goals, how they play in that, uh, uh, in that realm. Now, when we start off, there's a lot of definitions that are different from what we're used to talking about, uh, or the ways that we're used to speaking. Uh, these are, are people tied to, to ZLI with me here uh, on the board in one way or another. Um, when we talk about animal welfare, we're really talking about, for our, for our part, we're talking about uh, the individual metrics, you know, one by one. What, what is this animal in front of me? How do I relate to it or, or him or her, or how we want to, to classify that? We want to look at it in terms of its species, right? Because our bodies are not the same, right? You know, bodies are different from species to species. And then finally, we want to look at habitat because that's what generates animals, right? You know, habitat is absolutely crucial. We want to go back to that fundamental biological uh, criteria, 
right? To place habitat in its proper place. Because if we're talking about welfare, we're talking about how far an animal can go, human or non, from that initial condition before distress becomes too much, right? Before it becomes suffering. Um, the, the other, and the, the people on the side here, you know, uh, uh, Javier and Claudia and Naya and, and Kay, um, each of them stress aspects of this in their work. Uh, and, and so I, I wanted to recognize them here, uh, particularly when it comes down to, uh, to monitoring uh, and the practical aspects of understanding what's going on. Um, now, on the other side of the slide, you'll see this section working definitions. When we talk about light, we're talking about something very physical and very well understood uh, as in, in its physical terms, which normally like a physicist will come on and you know, you'll say, okay, here's the squiggle line with a circle around it, you know, wave particle duality. It's actually, you know, light is actually fully described by Maxwell's equations. Um, it, there are different types of ways to look at light that um, are very different from a physical model. But if we're talking about animal welfare and, and biologically relevant terms in that space, we really have to look at the physics and really have to look at how that, uh, the, the physical descriptions of light matter for the animals. And of the other two here, uh, again, we can do whole semesters on both of these, but if we're talking about life, we're actually gonna talk about consciousness. That's something that's, I think, fairly unique to ZLI now. We base that on the Cambridge Declaration, thinking of consciousness as something perceptual, right? Something that's linked to perception. There may be back of house work, there may be environmental factors, but consciousness and perception go together. That, that's an important move for us because it, it allows us then to think about, well, how do we measure something within mental welfare, right? Uh, which isn't really done yet. So we're really looking to do something adventurous there. And finally, by welfare, we're talking about distress management. You know, how do we reduce or manage the suffering that we have, right? We, 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 we're trying to take a very, um, uh, pragmatic may be the wrong word, but we're taking a, a very uh, hopeful attitude in reducing the suffering in the conditions that we face. And we're very keen to do to do that. And so when we talk about distress, well, animal welfare, we're talking about distress management. Those definitions actually change a little bit, I think, of perspective going forward, um, but they're open for conversation and to guidance. And I wanted to be really clear about that from the beginning uh, so that we can have those conversations and move together uh, in a collegial atmosphere. Now, biologically relevant light. This is very important when we're in a zoo or aquarium where lighting tends to dominate the conversations, right? Um, and, but lighting is actually part of what you might call a cultural approach to light, right? It's thinking about uh, most lighting is defined by, well, human vision or, or assessments of human vision. Um, but biology actually doesn't care about that. Uh, and th that's a key point because uh, because it means that decisions that might feel great in terms of presentation may not be the right decisions to make when we're thinking about how do we maintain the luminous environment of the animal in its physical terms. Now, all of these parameters here are incredibly valid, uh, whether it's theater, how do we present animals, how do we house animals so that we can you know, clean around them in a task-based mentality. We might think of... Um, and these were the departments that we had worked on, like whether it's a wash or, or you know, this tends to fit in that animal welfare design. Um, these approaches to light are, are wonderful in their spaces, but they don't really talk about the biology of the animal at all. And because of that, it's very hard to make productive decisions around care or conservation, actually. Um, with, uh, sorry, what? here we go. Um, with biologically relevant light, we're really talking about two things. One are the fields uh, that light represents, you know, electromagnetic fields, and they're completely defined by Maxwell's equation. So there's something very measurable in that, you know. Uh, and then there are photon density counts, you know, how cells respond to the absorption of that radiation in quanta. And th those are really the two criteria. 
And there are qualities to that. You know, we can look at the shape of light. We can look at the, the frequency distribution. We can look at the polarization of that. But ultimately, though, um, the base metrics comes down to these two aspects, Maxwell's equations and photon density counts. And, and that's it, you know, and, and, and to be very kind of blunt about it. Now, of course, it's not it in that kind of a simplistic way. When uh, we formed ZLI uh, in the beginning, our primary goal was to give money away, to find money and give money. And the goal was to guide research rather than scold, rather than saying, no, these are the wrong ways to do it. The idea was to say, look, do these kinds of studies, look into these parameters. And so we created this framework as a way to, design, uh, to def, uh, divide the sciences of light and life. So we might talk about uh, physiology, you know, how light affects a body right? Um, or operates within a body, right? Or relates body to body, right? In physical ways, right? Not mental ways at this point. Uh, sensory ecology, there we're really looking at mapping space. How do animals do it? Uh, and how do we map animals in that space? Uh, and there, you know, we might look at visual ecology or cross-sensory modalities, you know, how something like hearing or, or smell or magnetoreception might impact the visual aspects. Or we might look at coloration uh, and how coloration would relate to an animal's well-being in its context, right? And then finally, we would look at the broader ecological concepts based in integrative biology. So based in the uh, biological parameters, right? So things like epidemiology, how does disease spread and how does light impact how disease spreads? Or if we think of, uh, well, community resourcing food chains, how, do, how does light impact uh, an animal's success or relationships with regard to food, you know? And so that's a category or phenology, which is a little bit more abstract for, for most, right? Where we think of how seasonality and time work in terms of light, because the natural light cycles govern that flow of time in a very real way uh, in terms of the monitoring and it becomes, time becomes a resource, right? So anyway, at the end of the day, we looked at all of these categories and we said, okay, if we're going to talk about light and life, this is what we're going to focus on. This is how we're going to fund research. This is what we're going to look for money for, right? Looking at different kinds of studies for different kinds of animals uh, and different individual animals in this broad range of subjects. Oh, I think we've got a little bit of a, a, a mic and uh, uh, an open mic there. That's okay, right? Well, now, after we look at um, these kinds of studies, right, after we think about this, then we start to say, well, how does this matter, uh, matter for animal welfare? Like if, if, if I'm, and, and some of it may seem like obvious, right? But, but it's not though. If we say something like, uh, like seasonality, how does that matter for animal welfare? It's not uh, an initial thing we say, oh yeah, of course, it, you know, every, every animal should experience this, right? It's a little deeper than that. If we say accommodation, how the, the eye might adapt to different levels of light, right? It's not immediately apparent how that relates to something like welfare. Because, you know, on, on uh, well, either if we look at humans in terms of, you know, uh, species, or if we think in terms of individuals, and by individuals, I mean communities with different perspectives. If we think of, if we think of uh, how we might imagine an animal to, uh, to be in a positive state of welfare, it, it's not entirely clear as of yet. So we had a little bit of work to do. Um, and initially we turned to the, two main models that are out there, you know, looking at the five freedoms and looking at the five domains. And, and I'm assuming that the uh, 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 listeners here, um, the audience here, that you're familiar with these. Um, we looked at these and we, 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 we immediately had a problem. Um, and very grateful that they're there, but we had a problem in that, you know, we, we wanna talk about welfare in these biological terms because we don't feel we understand the animal's mental state adequately enough, right? I can't put myself in the mind of even like my dog, right? Or even uh, a fish or even a bird. I, I don't have that ability, right? You know, to step into someone else's mind. I can only speak back and forth 
or assess or read or study, right? So the, the, the freedoms themselves, you know, while that was a great step forward, I think, to recognize, you know, that we, we need to pay attention here, we weren't quite sure what that meant, you know? And, and, and so we, we set that aside and we looked at the domains. Uh, and with the five domains, um, the, the basic model, of course, is to look at environmental factors, look at health factors, look at nutrition factors, uh, measure them, uh, which again, the work of Claudia, uh, who I'm not sure if she's here because I can't see like the audience list, but um, like the work that, that Claudia does at, uh, in Singapore, it's very important to measure and monitor because you have criteria that then you can act on, right? And with those three initial categories, then you look at the behavioral studies. And you may look at norms, you know, for behavior, but you might also think of what a norm is in an unusual condition. A zoo aquarium is a very unusual condition for an animal that's generated in, in the wild, right? So th that question of condition becomes appropriate in behavioral studies. Finally, within the five domains model, there's this idea then that all of this figures in to positive or negative mental states. It's a cumulative trajectory. Um, but the, the assessments that we found with mental welfare were again more, uh, it, 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 it seemed like they were more to feeling. Now others may, we may have conversations about this to help educate me more, but they seemed they were a little bit more about feeling. Is the animal in a positive state of animal welfare or a negative state of welfare, right? Uh, and life is more complicated than that. We had that uh, understanding. So. We started thinking, well, how do we get to a mental state of, of animal welfare? How do we start to adjudicate what this might mean in these biologically relevant terms? So we, we actually rearranged the domains a little bit and said, look, if we're going to talk about mental welfare, let's put that first and see where we can get with all of this. Um, and again, here, we essentially, there's a bit Freudianism about this. You know, I, I won't, uh, uh, not that that's an easy you know, generalization, but, um, but really it's going back into Darwin and looking at, you know, that expression, how do you read expressions of an, of an other being you can't talk to, right? You read expressions. So Freud in this context becomes uh, an opportunity to talk about, you know, human expressions of larynx and throat and breath formed into words that you then, you know, uh, map out some kind of a mental space that has its physical relationships, but you can't necessarily know what that is. You have to kind of follow the mental, right? That's, that's basically, you know, uh, what that talking cure is, you know? It, it, and, and so here we said, okay, well, if we're gonna do this and we're gonna talk about um, uh, uh, animal consciousness, right? As the seat of animal welfare, right? Then that next step is to say, okay, well, if consciousness is in perception, well, then we have something to measure, right? And we're not necessarily getting to that point of positive or negative states. We're getting to a question of opportunities. What it is, is it that an animal gets to experience in its, in its, in its livelihood, right? This may seem like a long way from light and wildlife, but obviously it's going in that direction. Um, the point is we rearrange the five domains looking at those categories. So here we'll move from mental to nutrition, to health, to behavior, to environment, kind of that backwards. But the key thing to, the key takeaway point in this move is that we're really focused on light in each of these aspects, not simply in environment. What we're gonna show and what we're gonna argue is that light is actually key to every aspect of the five domains, right? And the way that you move forward in that is you measure the light. Now, this is a, it's a really packed slide and my apologies. I'm gonna to have to move quickly through some of this. Um, uh, again, this is a, a, a easily a semester's worth of work packed into 40 minutes. If I think of animal consciousness, right? There's no reason to think of that as being something simple, right? I may not be able to transpose what, you know, like a Freudian model or, 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 or something in that state over to animals, and I wouldn't want to into non-human animals, but I would like to take some key moments. Now, one of the things that the Declaration of Consciousness, and this is the 2020, uh, 2012, oops, sorry about that. This is the 2012 document that came out of Cambridge uh, in 2012. It recognized consciousness. But if I'm talking about human consciousness, 
I'm always talking about states of consciousness. This is another big move here, I think. If we're talking about states of consciousness in humans, there's no reason we wouldn't talk of states of consciousness in animals, right? There's no reason why we wouldn't have states of consciousness. If I'm talking about human consciousness, I would talk about states of uh, consciousness as being fundamental to what I would consider well-being, being able to explore and to develop these different aspects of mental life right, as being fundamental to what it is to be in a positive state of human welfare. Well, why wouldn't I do the same with non-human animals, right? Now, the key move here is to say that, all right, if, if we're talking about perceptual conscious systems, right, not something back of house, we're not talking dogmatic things, you know, theological things, we're talking about consciousness in that seat of perception, right? If these are going to show different states of consciousness, whether it's on the intake or in the expression, right? Then we're talking about the conditions that light affords. So this moment here and uh, 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 above the elephants or elephant, one elephant, right? You know, just divided twice. If we're talking about its relations to the environment, we're talking about different perceptual relationships an experience here that you might want to take. If you go outside at night where there's no artificial light, your eyes will adapt, right? Your eyes will adapt. You will see very differently in that condition than you do say at noon, right? At night, you'll be much more sensitive to motion. At night, you'll be much more sensitive uh, to, to, to the impact of other senses on your vision and how you react and respond. That's a different state of consciousness, right? Um, if we're talking about wildlife, those cycles of natural light are very important in this mental domain because they allow for these different perceptual states, which we're connecting to different conscious states, which we're connecting to a range of opportunities that indicate a set of um, what an animal might explore as the positive form of welfare. And again, I'm going to try to move a little quickly because uh, you know there's, there's always a lot to cover, but there's no need to get too deeply into all of this. There's just two main moments here. Um, if you think of the flows of natural light, we might think of intensity. Now here they're using Lux. You know this is an old NOAA diagram. You know that I've used many times in talks. Um, it's really there to indicate how extreme the change of of electromagnetic radiation light is between night and day. It doesn't even get into microhabitats or shape here. But the idea, though, is to think about how we might create pictures in the day, right, as humans, or, sorry about that, or how we might react at night at these lower levels. When artificial light comes in, it wipes out uh, about eight of these orders of magnitude immediately, just in terms of intensity. Um, and so, but of course, we're not necessarily talking just about intensity. We're talking about the shape of light, the diffusion of light. Um, right, I used to lecture on Kandinsky's point line plane as a way to describe, you know, this, this presence of light in the environment. This is Dan Nielsen's work at Lund University, where we start to create a metric for light. Uh, but again, uh, it was brilliant, a, a brilliant transition. And I have to give Dan always his proper uh, credit for all of this, um, because this is what needs to be measured uh, as we move forward to think about what the conditions are that animals find themselves within. And for our part, as part of the Zala stations, we're actually advancing this a little further using a scientific camera that can measure individual photon frequencies in this three-dimensional state. Now, I'm not gonna go through all of these in, in, in depth like that, uh, but I do wanna emphasize that light plays its role in all of the domains. So like say with nutrition, and, and this is key, uh, with nutrition, you all heard the expression, we eat with our eyes. Uh, nothing can be, could be truer. But it's not simply ingestion. It's the whole process of breaking down, absorbing, and eliminating food and dealing with that elimination. Um, if you remember too, I'm, I'm sure you all remember from elementary school, mammals evolved at night, right? You know, um, early mammals completely nocturnal. I mean, every animal is nocturnal, right? We all live on the planet all the time. Um, but the idea is what we do during that time. Um, but with the eye as a predation mechanism, it actually plays a much broader role than that because hormones are connected to the eye. Uh, and if not the eye, the cells are connected 
to hormones and the cycling of light over time. Those cycles really govern the endocrine axis. And it's not simply melatonin, right? We've heard that a lot and it's wonderful that people talk about it, but it actually touches on every single aspect that we would consider a living function. So the eye itself, it plays an opportunistic role, right? In capturing prey. And this works for reproduction as well. You could easily do this, even though the five domains don't touch on it. Um, th there's that uh, the biology of reproduction, I mean. Um, there's that opportunistic moment of how an eye relates to predation. Uh, and, and there are many mechanisms within the eye. It's not simply like a, a screen that, you know, a little homunculus in the back sits and takes notes. Um, Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm new to PowerPoint, which is weird being I've used it since the 80s. Um, with uh, the endocrine axis, though, you look at, you can see some of the relationships that light plays. Light governs these axes, right? Through the, in humans, it's, this is a human description, right? So this is going to have to be different for different species. But the idea, though, that light and reproduction go together, or light and aging go together, or light and digestion go together, or immune system, mood, right, you know, uh, which again, qualifies the affect and the potential for exploring those different states of consciousness. All of those fit into the cycling of light. So at the end of the day, it's really impossible to think of animal welfare without thinking about this. Um, even in terms of health, again, the question moving from nutrition, it's very similar where you start to think about, you know, balance and opportunities as defining what health is. Right? We have to be very brave and not say, well, we can't define that. It's going to be different for different people. We have to be a little brave and say, this is how we're going to talk about it. And, and we do. So, and here we're talking about fitness levels and, uh, you know, uh, uh, here we go. Um, fitness levels and, and, and also um, how an animal is prepared to engage those environments. Uh, th these, are, these are rather hard slides here. Uh, this is a rather hard slide. When we're talking about healthcare, we're talking about preventative and heroic measures, right? So the Zala stations that we talk about, we're really thinking of those as preventative healthcare stations, the way that hospitals and veterinary clinics would have gone into zoos and aquariums back in the early uh, 2000s. Um, the slides on the board, it shows that you really have to pay attention to these frequencies in the opportunistic way. Animals have different action spectra, non-human animals have different action spectra than humans. On the other side, uh, that's actually a slide from the John Ott uh, film, uh, uh, Exploring the Spectrum, a few years ago. Um, I put it on there because in, in one case, you have an animal, uh, 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 the lab rat, that is um, restricted from certain frequencies in the environment and one where uh, it's not. Right? And in one, you'll see the tumors develop, the tails fall, fall off. The condition is horrific. That's an issue of preventative health care. Right, and it's solely light based, right? It, it's important to go back to that, I think. Mm -hmm. So again, in the interest of time, with behavior and environment, I'm gonna put those two together. Um, with behavior, we're getting to a point where we think of behavior as expression in light. You know, what are those internal states and how do they manifest themselves going out? It could be in actions, it might be in postures, it might be in vocalizations. Um, but in terms of light, light is actually what conveys that. And in terms of the environment here, rather than simply think of that abstract biological environment as a whole, we're talking about how it matters for the particular individual species or habitat. It's very different. The terms of those animals that are discernible in the studies become very important as to what the environment might be. So Jill Mellon had this wonder, uh, uh, wonderful researcher down at Disney. She had this wonderful set a few years ago talking about, uh, you know, uh, I believe it was seven, forgive me if I get this wrong, seven areas that you would wanna provide a feline in managed care rather than thinking of abstract space. It's so what we're talking about when we talk about environment. How do you think about what it is under the animal's terms that are only discernible through study? right? How do those manifest themselves? That's what environment is, right? And it's why that full natural cycle matters. Now, with the standardized metric here, again, we have all of these studies. The first thing is always funding research. That's always the first thing we go to. Um, and there are quite a few metrics out there. We're trying to, you know, standardize all of that so that when we talk about zoo and aquarium work or animals in other conditions too, whether it's in the, you know, near human cities, 
in the in the wild, you know, which is the same thing, really. Uh, and and we can argue about that for a long time. Um, uh, but uh, or or if we're talking about research, you know, which still exists, or if we're talking about um, agriculture, right? We're talking. We want to get to distress reduction. There are many things we might measure. And here, the lighting me uh, metrics, even though I put that second to light, are actually very important. Uh, thinking about, say, what the flicker is of a lamp, because you know, an, an animal's eye can't refresh itself, right, under those conditions. I mean, nobody would want to live under a strobe light, right? Or if we think about, uh, you know, those elevated light levels and how there might be a stress level that's already there in these relationships. You know, due to certain frequencies allowing for something and not another. The, the key moment in this is measuring these aspects, which are again, human-based industrial cultural you know, parameters. They're important, but they're important insofar as it's, it's a starting point to thinking about what I can provide, what I need to take away or what I need to add. Because again, in a managed care situation, we're moving an animal from one habitat to another, and there will be supplemental heroic medical therapies needed in artificial light. But I would always think of it that way, that the lighting is a heroic or preventative care measure that comes second after understanding what it is we're trying to get at. Um, and this, in terms of the other uh, sets, uh, you know, again, uh, uh, these are Javier Claudia's you know, assessments over you know, the years. There are many uh, aspects that are firmly ensconced in animal welfare monitoring that re they remain in place and very valuable. So um, I include them here because we want to build up towards the future. Now, if I'm talking about, and I see I've got just a few minutes left, about five minutes left, with the Zala stations, uh, we're really looking at providing a new kind of exhibit, right? This, uh, a new kind of exhibit that makes animal welfare the face of the zoo and aquarium world, that just puts it right out there. Not something that tells people what to do, but says, look, join in this work, help us figure out together what we're going to do. We believe it has to be independent to build public trust and adaptable uh, you know, to local conditions. Um, a, a correlate would be, say, like a food franchise, uh, trying to think like a, of a healthy one. Uh, you know, uh, we'll say like a, a, maybe not healthy anymore, but we'll say like a Starbucks, right? The way that that franchise builds up attention, uh, you know, to its product uh, is very important, and there's a mechanism to it. These all stations fit in that realm, you know, where we want to build up this global appreciation for animal welfare and animal welfare monitoring uh, that then becomes something that communities can hang their hats on in different ways, depending on the cultural perspectives that we're facing. Uh, I already showed a little bit of this, so I'm gonna skip through this. Uh, what we're looking for is partners. You know, there's lots of ways to make money in all of this and, and to move forward. Um, uh, but here, the most important thing, I think, in the last five minutes of the talk is to connect all this to sustainable design uh, goals, right? Sustainable design goals. Because if we're talking about light and opportunity, if we're talking about light and hormones, and, and that's really, the, I think, one of the main uh, recognitions of this rearrangement is that, you know, hormones and all of the things that hormones depend on are related to light, right? Um, what that means, in, in, from an animal welfare perspective, is that we're going to focus on each individual species uh, and uh, habitat closely. And that close attention allows us to make better decisions in wildlife conservation, right? It may not always be a palatable decision. Uh, they may be difficult decisions. They're not going to be easy decisions. But understanding those relationships on a one by one basis. Right, the same way you cure poverty, it's one by one, right? That actually improves wildlife conservation, right? By increasing understanding. And then finally, wildlife conservation from this animal welfare perspective, right? That has the, uh, the purpose of improving sustainable design goals. And by these, I mean something very specific, even though we have to give an interpretation to it. I mean the SDGs 
uh, that you've seen, you've all seen this many, many times, where we think of economy, we think of education, we think of equality, we think of um, uh, uh, pollutants in the environment with like, like pollution, right? It's actually not a bad term. Um, if we think about like energy generation, right? All of these areas can really be looked at through the lens of animal welfare in this light-based way, right? Um, for ZLI's part, we've divided uh, SDGs into these very simple categories. Uh, applied photobiology is not something that's easy to raise money for. I will say that very clearly, uh, you know, because it, it seems very abstract to people, but it applies to all of these measures. Right. If we're talking about, I'll start with food security, insects, you know, the insect apocalypse refers to the declining insects numbers globally, light pollution, and even like, you know, the porch light and the street light and the research light and the headlamp play a huge role in the decline of insects, it doesn't get talked enough, uh, talked about enough. Um, but that means that food security, food, you know, human food, depends on, on insects, you know, to, to remain viable. If you take insects out, you impact that SDG, right? Uh, with mental health, anxieties, you know, the restriction of hormone flow due to artificial light increases anxieties. That's a mental health issue. Um, or, uh, or the other physical aspects also contribute to that. But the easiest way is to, again, go back to that hormone relationship or the opportunities of exploring those mental states of consciousness that we don't normally think about, right? You know, they, they actually allow for replenishment. You know, think of meditation and how that works, mindfulness. Uh, the other uh, issues on here, anti-bigotry, that is a huge issue. Uh, you know, and, and again, that's a seminar in and of itself around our beached campaign. But the idea that the adaptability, say, of a cetacean sensory system going from, you know, the bottom of the ocean to the surface, right, being able to accommodate, you know, all of those uh, 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 moments, that was a fundamental driver for that beached campaign as a way to think about how do we get in that in our relationships uh, with others. Um, so there's, there's a bit of an allegory there, but all of these campaigns, they, they have three things. They have an animal species, right, or a class uh, that's presented uh, to make it easy to understand what's going on. They have a, um, uh, an issue uh, like mental health, reproductive health, so on and so forth. And then they have a context, an international context. So anyway, this is how we would look at the SDG values built around light in a very, uh, uh, first-hand way. Uh, and, and these are subject to development as we go on. I mean, there'll be new ones that will come. And uh, so, and again, this is an environmental issue. If you think of what light pollution is, uh, birds, insects, aquatic life, it all migrates. You know, if, if you light up New York, you're damaging the rainforest. If you put glass on a building that reflects light in such a way that causes and is responsible for birds flying into it, you're affecting Southern hemisphere life. Uh, it's the purpose of our Save the Birds, uh, A Billion Birds campaign. Um, but again, the, the point is that light is habitat, this electromagnetic uh, radiation, the flows. Um, we make documentaries, uh, you know, we make films. I'm so excited about this. We, our photodiversity films, actually, we're doing a film called The Afterlife of Whales now. The purpose of this is to build audiences on the terms that people enjoy uh, and engage, very simply. So, you know, we had made, we started with documentaries and we'll do more in the future, I'm sure, uh, but we're really looking at docudramas and to enter into the space where people can present their real, really deep felt issues on screen and identify with characters going through some very difficult issues. Uh, and we have two types, you know, eco docudramas and uh, folktale trilogies in, that, uh, in this space. Um, and there are ways that other, you know, that we can help. We do dining in the dark and, you know, we have our film festivals and we're trying to get uh, natural light tours so people can understand what it is that they don't experience. Uh, I don't know how many of you saw, um, you know, fifth magnitude stars in the last month, but it's not going to be many. Uh, you know, so we have to kind of put that into people's minds that this is a reality, you know, that there, there is a world out there that needs to be engaged with again. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm going to end on that because I see my, my, my 
If I do it now, I'll have it exactly 45 minutes. So, uh, but please, we're always looking for partners, always looking for ways to think about how we might move this work forward uh, and to put animal welfare at the, the forefront of sustainable design and but simply entertainment as well, you know, thinking how we do this all in a positive way. So on that note, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen if I can figure out how to do that. And uh, well, I'll just leave this on the board. But thank you, Simon, I'll turn it back over to you. Wow. <laughs> thank you, James. That's, um, as always, fascinating to listen to you. And, um, and it's just mind blowing. And, and we've got a lot of questions, um, which I will do my best to, to, to go through um, and try and amalgamate some of them because there's a similar topic running through them. Um, mm. But yeah, um, thank you again. Um, thank you. Uh, so um, the, the, some of the questions referring to obviously uh, captive animal welfare, because uh, I'd imagine that's uh, the, the sure. bulk of our audience. Um, um, so um, in terms of uh, your definition of, of welfare, mm -hmm. can you use light to both manage distress, but evaluate welfare, uh, sorry, evaluate welfare opportunities? Can it have a healing effect or is that dependent mm -hmm. on the importance of it to that particular species? I, I think, I, I hope I'm not frustrating in my answers, uh, but I, I, I would say, you know, both, you know, to those that, you know, on the one hand, thinking of light in terms of preventative care, right, you know, figuring out what parameters and uh, are appropriate for an animal, that's kind of like the first step for the species, and but it may be an individual as well. One of the, the benefits of going to a perceptual consciousness mode in all of this, right? You know, to think of welfare in terms of that perceptual consciousness is that it actually recognizes that the back of house matters, you know, um, in, in that, that perceptual consciousness, it, if I take that, you know, psychoanalytic, you know, uh, trope, you know, like to kind of bring into this, that there's a lot going on internally. If that expresses itself at that surface level, it doesn't deny that there's all of these difficult things in the background. It just personalizes it for individual ways that I recognize I can't access easily, right? That I have to spend some time to tease that out. Um, and in terms of the other, in terms of the positive applications of light, absolutely. Uh, I mean, how many infants, human infants, you know, suffer from bilirubin, you know? And, and there's a heroic use of light in that case to replenish the uh, human organism at that level, you know, to bring it into a more viable future. So, and, and I think, you know, if, if, I, if I take that, you know, in terms of preventative care, thinking about what the setting is for an animal uh, in managed care and recognizing that, you know, that one, that NOAA diagram that I always, I always show, but that NOAA diagram that has those 11 orders of magnitude of light, again, recognizing that when a light bulb goes on, you lose eight of those, right? That's eight orders of habitat that are eliminated from the animal. And some species are super resilient. You know, maybe they just, maybe, or maybe they normally occupy in their, con in their active state that, uh, that high level, but most actually occupy those lower levels most of the time. So like, add, one of the reasons I'm so cautious about adding artificial light, which is, is a bit crazy for the industry right now, right? But one of the reasons I'm so cautious about that is because it immediately introduces distress. By distress, I mean the difference between a natural condition, a distress potential from a natural condition, whatever that might be over time, right? You know, uh, to that housed condition. It, it, the, the further you go, say from midnight at midnight, the more distress you're introducing into that situation. Uh, if I can put it that way, you know, it's a, it's an oversimplification, but the idea though is that light at midnight is not the same at light at dawn as light at dawn or, or light at twilight and light at dawn are very different too, because there's a sequential aspect to this, you know, in the daytime, if I, um, if I'm at the beach all day, right. Uh, and I finally get to relax at twilight from the sun, right. That's much different from leaving through the whole night where you know, I don't have that constant pounding of solar radiation. And all of a sudden, then I'm exposed to it gradually in the morning. That's a much different condition. So like the absolute values and all this, and sorry to like kind of move a little bit away from the question, but the idea though, is that that distress comes from the difference. 
And the differences though are dynamic. That that would be kind of like the overall okay. response there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's um it's it's a it's a huge topic and 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 you know we yeah. could have a whole series of webinars throughout the whole year and still not cover it all. So I really appreciate <laughs> you trying to condense it into a, into a, into a few sentences. But um uh, th that this sort of this next question leads on to to that I guess and it's mm. um sort of when we try and replicate environments or, or that lighting environment mm. within a in a captive facility or 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 maybe we don't replicate try and replicate it from a for a species that's come from like a tropical region to a mm -hmm. northern or southern hemisphere um how how would that impact the animal so i, I guess i'm trying to merge several questions into into one but you know with with migration and breeding you know hormone changes and all these different cycles that an animal goes through is it better to to not try and put artificial lighting in you know how how some zoos create an environment for the visitor to replicate you know the, the light cycles of a nocturnal species or mm. so i just wondered what your thoughts were on on how how that impacts the animal's health and welfare you know I, in I, various I, regions i actually um it may sound contradictory uh but i actually think that the lighting is necessary exactly because of that because we're moving animals from one space to another if there's any poster species or po poster class for all this, it would be penguins. Um, because there's already a recognition that, you know, blacking out, you know, during winter months, say, if you're keeping kings or, or, or you know, emperor, you know, blacking out that space at certain times are really important, right? Um, I, I would come back to answer that to say, one, you're always going to have distress. There's no such, and, and this doesn't just apply to zoos and aquariums, it applies to the wild as well. Um, because of what light pollution is, right, or human development is, there's always an introduction of what we might call distress into the environment, always, right? Zoo and aquarium work, I actually view as absolutely necessity. I mean, it's why, you know, I, 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 I uh, absolutely adore, you know, like JAZA and AZA and WAZA um, and, 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 and uh, you know, because it's absolutely essential work. Now, what I would say here is that the measuring is a way to manage distress. You know, it's so, and, and the measuring though, like the decision that that allows you to improve animal welfare with, with this re relocation of animals and providing artificial light, it allows you to decide what's important and what's not over those 11 orders of magnitude of light, recognizing it. I mean, and there's a theatrical component to that. I mean, with say darkening out of space, let's take that as an example. I mean, the old nocturnal houses, they, they always suffered a little bit because there wasn't enough transition time during the day, you know, to move somebody from a bright light space into the dark, so you end up in the dark rather than adapted to the dark. But something there, if we're actually doing a theatrical presentation, say, of penguins in the winter, uh, you know, allowing guests to walk in the dark and managing the exhibit in such a way that that's both safe and comfortable and exciting and enjoying, that's the direction that I would take. You know, and it could be on foot. It could be more of like a, a theme parky sort of a thing. I mean, how many how many amusement park rides are in the dark? You know, so like th there's a lot of ways to do that, but again, it all depends on measuring and then on measuring, acknowledging that there is distress everywhere, and it's a question of managing it and not pretending that it's not there, and then finally taking the measurements and deciding what it is I want to do in terms of exhibition, in terms of management, in terms of care, based in that relationship to the indigenous luminous conditions. That, that's how I would, you know, sketch it out in a packed sentence, but. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, and um, talking about um, consciousness and, and, and sentience in species, mm. um, I don't know if you've done any work or, or aware of any work that's been done on invertebrates and, and light. Yeah, I, I quite a bit actually. I mean, there, there are quite a lot. You know, obviously, uh, you know, with uh, uh, octopi, octopi in the last, you know, very public way, it's absolutely essential. I, I think um, I. As much as I, I won't attribute a, uh, something like a soul. I got asked this online, and I was a little offended actually when I was asked it. Somebody asked me if I had a, thought I had a soul once, right? As much as that might be palatable in certain contexts, 
uh, when we're talking about biology, we're actually talking about distress. Uh, and, and that's, it's a different question, you know, and, and I say that with invertebrates because a lot of people simply don't care about insects or wildlife and it's, it's insignificant. It's something you can step on. Uh, and, and yet, you know, the model of a cruel child, you know, from when I was a, a small child is pulling the wings off of a fly. You know, it's a horrible thing. And because it has that, I mean, there are many sides to that. There, there's the human element of what that does to a person as a person to express that cruelty in that way. Uh, without recognizing that there's a life that needs replenishing. Um, there's, so I, I think with something like sentience, I would, again, go back to that Cambridge Declaration and say, yes, you know, the suffering of the insect or invertebrates matters, right? It matters. Um, and uh, for, for many, but it matters for the animal. Like if I'm going to displace my, 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 uh, personal feelings of pleasure and sympathy. It matters for the animal. Um, but it, 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 it's something again, that I don't have access to how necessarily, but I still have to manage it, you know? So it, it's, it's very much about managing that distress. Um, and, and absolutely, I mean, agriculture is a thing. You, you know, if I'm gonna have a field of uh, vegetables and, and I need to spray, to prevent you know that field from being uh, devastated, I, I I understand that you know that there's a, a there's an SDG value in that. However, I would want to reduce the impacts that I was having in the old Russell and Burke three R model, you know, to to move forward productively. Okay, um, so yes, yeah, sticking with the the, the SDGs, um, are you aware of any any um, studies or, or research that's been carried out or is going to be carried out to look at how light um, is considered in, in animal and, and human health? I, I think it's very broad right now. Um, with human health, uh, Harvard Medical, you know, the School of Environments published a lot of good research over the years. It's scattered. I mean, one of the reasons for ZLI is to gather that research together in one place, uh, but we need help and funding to do that. Um, but I think these initial steps of saying, look, this is how, so with mental welfare uh, or diabetes, you know, there, there are actually plenty of clinical studies. I, I would refer the, the, the Harvard, um, uh, it, it's part of the Harvard Medical Complex, uh, the School of the Environment. For, forgive me, sometimes my mind slips me a little bit. Like, I forget uh, you know, things I should remember. Um, but uh, they, they, they do exist, though. The papers are there. Some of them are on our site. Uh, some of them, the International Dark Sky Association put you know, links. Uh, they have a wonderful database online already. Um, so yeah, they're, they're there. Uh, you know, the, the, the scattered papers are there. It needs a book. You know, it needs all sorts of things. So. OK. Um, yeah, I think we're, we're, we're sort of just about over time. So we'll, we'll, we'll try and sorry for, for anyone who's asked, asked a question we haven't got to. Um, but we'll probably end on this one um, and, and going back to the, the start maybe and about the commercial um, benefits of, of animal welfare for, for particularly zoos and aquariums. Um, you know, you go into a bit more detail about, you know, the, the financial aspects potentially of, 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 of the, the animal welfare stations and, and the costs involved in, in, in setting up or running a, a, a the Zala station. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, with the Zala stations, th there's two ways that we do this. Uh, one being the right way and one being sort of a transitional way. Uh, the right way is to actually create them as an exhibit. So instead, uh, and if I take a, uh, a typical, a larger exhibit, but if I say like a 10 million pound, you know, a new exhibit that would feature a charismatic mammal, right? Uh, maybe, maybe 20, you know, 20 million pounds, maybe 30 million pounds, right? Um, there's a limit to how far that succeeds, right? At the end of the day, there's only so many people you can fit in the park and the expenses go up. So you end up having to charge or to subsidize that. With Azala Station, right, as an exhibit, it's much more lucrative because it, it, it has an on-site presence, but its work is connected to the community in general. And that means that the space of the zoo, the physical space is actually much 
uh, uh, greater. It's extended out into the community where there's a constant presence thinking about work. And an example would be like one of our projects that I'm particularly proud of, it's a Biking for Birds campaign. And the, the idea is to have, uh, uh, well, people on bikes monitoring bird collisions. Uh, we focus on um, uh, uh, African-American communities here in the US, right? That's our, our goal, right? Um, but the idea though, is to put people on bikes, give them access to nature in terms of a, an educational program, but connect them to the community to monitor bird collisions with windows uh, and to start to mitigate that. But it has that dual purpose of integrating people in the community with that Zala, ZLI, zoo marketing potential to really drive that community engagement, you know, and presence. And that creates markets, you know, it creates new financial streams. So if a sponsor say, I'll take a, uh, any bank of choice, I won't name one because it's a recorded webinar, right? But um, if I take any bank of choice and they sponsor a zoo, rather than just giving money to the zoo, if they commit to an SDG retrofit of, of branches, right, that would eliminate exposed glass and protect birds that way and then market to their customers, it's much more effective for the zoo because then, or aquarium, because then it's in the community all the time in front of people in ways that actually address a fundamental ecological and animal welfare oriented problem, birds colliding into windows. Right. You know, if you if you put a advertising film on the outside of glass or even better, a screen, you know, or a louver or something like that, you've done a much greater job than, say, how creating a new aviary in the facility that maybe might be completely bird friendly, but it's not connected into transformation in the community. So with the Zala station and that's and that's financially lucrative. So with the Zala stations that connection of zoo to community is important one because you actually accomplish the goals that you set out to do uh, on the animal welfare approach but also because you tie revenue back into that proposition and you make it financially lucrative to start monitoring measuring being mindful uh, there was a question on the list about uh, uh ayurveda and forgive me my, 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 my speech is sometimes wrong um, and, and I would say absolutely, you know, that uh, the timing of things matters, seasonality matters, because it drives that moment of transaction constantly. You know, January is not the same as March, it's not the same as February. I might even define the calendar differently, right? But the idea, though, in those seasonal light-driven events becomes a driver for transactions that then drives the finances again of the aquarium or zoo, as a way to move forward productively into the future where we're not always looking for money after the next you know pandemic comes you know or something like that so it's very important in this industry because it's so vital uh which again another another webinar but because it, zoos and aquariums are so vital being able to link an animal welfare approach to development is super important uh and in any way that we can so Right. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks for, for managing to answer an, an extra question right at the end as well. Um, I appreciate that. I appreciate uh, the generosity here. No, uh, I, I thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, and, and thanks again to, to Dr. Fisher for, for a fascinating and, and very thought provoking presentation. Um, this recording will be available um, on the, the Wild Welfare and Global Animal Welfare um, websites or YouTube channels. Uh, and please follow us on, on social media and follow Zoo Lighting Institute um, for, for um, any upcoming news uh, and events um, for our res retrospect uh, respective um, charities. So I will end it there. Thank you very much for joining us. And thanks again to, to James. Thank you. Thank, you very, thank you very much. Please always feel free to contact me anytime. That's why I always put my email out there. But thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Okay. Good day. Bye.